Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by John Swinney on an update on Scotland's education reforms. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of his statement. So there's been no interventions or interruptions. I call on John Swinney, Cabinet Secretary, please. <coughs> Officer, the relentless focus of this government is to deliver an education system in Scotland which raises attainment for all, closes the attainment gap and enables all children and young people to fulfil their potential. During my statement to Parliament on the 26th of June last year, I set out our landmark agreement with Scotland's local councils which provide their clear and shared agenda for the empowerment of schools rather than by introducing legislation. I undertook at that time to return to Parliament with my assessment of whether sufficient progress on our shared ambition had been made to satisfy me that the non-legislative route was the right one. I'm therefore grateful for this opportunity to provide Parliament with an update on the progress around school empowerment and our related programme of education reform. My statement this afternoon is accompanied by a publication which provides additional detail on work in this area. International evidence demonstrates that successful education systems are those where decisions about the education of our children are made to them as, uh, as close to them as possible. That is why we are committed to empowering schools, to empower head teachers, te te teachers parents, uh, pupils and the wider school community to make the key decisions which affect the educational outcomes of children and young people. With our partners in local government, professional associations and other stakeholders, we are taking steps to put teachers, parents and communities in the driving seat. Together, we are building a school and teacher-led education system. A crucial element of this government's agenda has been to recognise the importance of excellent school leadership and in turn to empower head teachers to, to more effectively lead our schools. The Head Teachers Charter, published in February, aims to ensure schools have wide-ranging decision-making powers over what matters – learning, teaching and the curriculum, their resources, staffing and budgets – and make these decisions by involving their whole school community. This delivers on the policy intention originally part of the draft education bill. The Charter supports a culture of empowerment that enables all professionals to contribute to the agenda of improvement. The Charter, in combination with linked school leaders' guidance, is now being used by schools and has been crucially been co-produced. I am grateful for the shared work that has led to the production of the Charter and I am particularly pleased at the pace with which it has been delivered. I am also pleased to be able to report that today we have published updated devolved school management guidelines. This new guidance has also been developed in partnership with local government, while improving on existing advice crucially reflects the expectations and opportunities of an empowered school system, including the Head Teachers Charter. The Scottish Attainment Challenge and Pupil Equity Funding have already empowered schools by allowing them to design solutions and take decisions specific to their school community. It is important we now capitalise on this and deliver broader budgetary decision making to our schools. I have also committed to providing high quality support for school leaders, many of whom are now beginning to operate in an increasingly empowered environment. With this in mind, I am pleased to note that last month Education Scotland expanded the support they provide for head teachers and will now provide a range of professional learning opportunities specifically focused on school empowerment. This in combination with our investment in Columba 1400 Head Teacher Leadership Academies with the Hunter Foundation will provide school leaders with the skills and confidence to flourish and deliver improved outcomes for the communities they serve. We are also deepening the support available to schools through regional improvement collaboratives. Through enhanced engagement and support across local government, supported by additional Scottish Government funding of around £5 million this year and focused support from Education Scotland, the regional improvement collaboratives have significantly enhanced their capacity to support collaborative working across the system and to deliver region-wide approaches to improving outcomes for our children and young people. This is evidenced through the delivery of their September 2018 regional improvement plans, through increased engagement with and support of the teachers' networks across each region, and through focused regional interventions on attainment, curriculum development, leadership development and quality improvement. An interim review of the establishment of the regional improvement collaboratives was also published in February this year, it recognised the significant early progress that had been made in establishing local governance, leadership and buy-in across each regional improvement collaborative area. We will commission a further review later this year, again in partnership with local government, to assess the development and the impact further. We are committed to ensuring both pupils and parents are provided with the opportunity to influence decisions related to their school. 
This is more important than ever in an increasingly empowered school system. In July 2018, we developed a comprehensive plan in conjunction with local government to improve parental involvement and engagement. The Learning Together Action Plan 2018 to 2021. This plan demonstrates our long-term commitment to put parents at the heart of their children's learning and reflects the importance we place on parental engagement with a range of Scottish Government education policies and initiatives. Learners in our schools rightly expect their voice to be both heard and valued. The Head Teachers Charter plays a, places a central expectation on head teachers and through that to the wider empowered system to support and encourage children and young people to participate in decisions about their own learning and the life of the learning community. In April 2018, in advance of the school empowerment reforms, Education Scotland published practical guidance to schools. We will continue to promote this guidance and support to schools in order that they can better support learner participation. It is important that the work in taking forward the joint agreement is placed in the context of wider education reforms. In particular, I was pleased to note last month's publication of the report of the Independent Panel on Career Pathways. This is an exciting report that will generate new and ambitious career pathways for teachers whilst increasing the attractiveness of the profession. I expect the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers to have put in place the conditions for new pathways by August 2021. It is also important that we recognise and support a wider range of practitioners who work with our children and young people. While we decided against the creation of a broader Education Workforce Council, we are working with local authorities to further enhance the support offered to a wide range of education practitioners, including college lecturers, instrumental music instructors, school librarians and home school link workers. It is clearly vital that we understand the impact of our endeavours in empowering Scottish schools. We need to know where change is happening and, and where it's having a positive effect and indeed where greater focus may be required. The early evidence we have available does however provide me with, a, with cautious optimism that the types of empowered practice that I expect to see are now becoming more common. Education Scotland has previously published thematic inspections on readiness for empowerment and on curriculum leadership and has today published the findings of a further inspection on parent and pupil participation. While making clear that we are only part way through this journey, these reports indicate that local authorities are taking positive steps to embrace the principles of empowerment set out in the joint agreement and that the education system is committed to collaboration and co-production. The Readiness for Empowerment Review, published in December 2018, noted that almost all local authorities are committed to developing an empowered education system with the aim of improving outcomes for learners, reducing inequalities and closing the attainment gap. It is important that we all take responsibility for the change process, and I'm pleased that three local authorities are now also trialling a self-evaluation framework. I'm also pleased that an overarching evaluation strategy is being developed that will bring together all available evidence on empowerment in our schools, which will help us to monitor progress. Equally important is the assurance that I have received jointly from the Chief Inspector of Education as Chair of the Joint Agreement Steering Group uh, that partners remain firmly engaged in and committed to this work. This has, highlighted, this has highlighted to me and to COSLA that real progress has been made and that the practice of empowerment and school-based decision-making is becoming increasingly evident in our schools. The Chief Inspector has also stressed to me the importance and the value of the collaborative approach we are taking with local government and other partners in the delivery of these reforms. She believes that progress has been made sooner than would have been the case through legislation and reassures me of the continued commitment of all partners to work together in supporting the delivery of an empowered system which improves outcomes for children and young people. This includes a clear objective to promote and build on the work to date, developing further guidance and engaging with the wider system with schools, teachers and others involved in children's learning. While I'm heartened by these positive messages, I am under no illusion that we remain at a relatively early stage in our efforts to change the culture of school education in Scotland. The joint agreement and the recently agreed teachers pay deal provide us with the stability required for real and long-term system change to take place. But we must maintain our collective focus and ensure meaningful improvements are delivered. When I last addressed members on this issue in June 2018, I made it clear that if sufficient progress had not been made in the forthcoming 12 months, 
I would return to Parliament and introduce an education bill. This afternoon, I have set out my view that progress is being made in a genuinely collaborative spirit and a culture based around empowerment is starting to take root in our schools. It is clear to me that we would not have come so far in such a short period of time if we had relied on introducing an education bill. I am also assured that this government's long-term vision of a school-led education system is shared by our partners in local government. The Chief Inspector has further endorsed and recommended to me the continuation of our partnership approach. Given this, I am able to confirm that the Scottish Government will not introduce an education bill as means of driving school empowerment Instead, we will continue to work in partnership with local government, teacher representatives and the wider education sector. We will collectively ensure that schools are supported to take the key decisions relevant to them. Presiding officer, I'm optimistic that our collaborative approach through which we share a view of empowerment and collectively take responsibility for change will result in improved outcomes for Scotland's children and young people. Achieving excellence and equity for all of our children and young people is the core purpose of this government and these reforms are central to this work. Given the importance of this agenda, I would be pleased to return to Parliament in a year's time to once again provide an update on this vital work. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on his statement. As usual, around 20 minutes, could I ask those members who wish to ask a question to press the request to speak now? And I call Liz Smith, to be followed by Ian Gray. Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, and can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for prior sight. In the 2017 programme for government, Deputy First Minister, Deputy Presiding Officer, the First Minister told us this. A new education bill will deliver the biggest and most radical change on how our schools are run. But then exactly a year ago, the Cabinet Secretary decided to scrap the bill, defending the U-turn by telling us that faster progress would be made to improve school standards without legislation. Now he is telling us that he has cautious optimism that standards are improving and that this improvement has not been made to be possible because of the absence of the education bill. Deputy Presiding Officer, you couldn't make it up because there are no hard facts whatsoever to prove his contention. Indeed, it will not have escaped his notice that the Education Committee reported just recently, and I quote, the lack of baseline data means no meaningful conclusions on upward or downward trends can be reached at a time of reform within Scottish education. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary exactly what evidence it is that he has found that nobody else has found to prove that standards are improving across the board? Does he really believe that evidence supports his view when he says, and I quote, that it is clear that we would not have come so far if an education bill had been introduced? And finally, does he believe that when a local authority takes a blanket decision to move all its schools to a six-column subject choice structure for pupils in S4, head teachers enjoy the greater autonomy promised by the Scottish Government. Cabinet Secretary. Um, there's quite a lot of uh, topics covered in that uh, question, Mr. So, so forgive me as I uh, try to address them. In relation to my uh, statement to Parliament today, where I have recorded that I believe faster progress has been delivered by uh, the collaborative route we've taken as opposed to the legislative route, I would cite uh, this evidence. Firstly, that if we had been involved in a legislative process around the bill, uh, we would not have been able to focus partners on the delivery of some of the specific components of the education bill. So the Head Teachers Charter is now available, delivered, implemented in Scottish education, when if we'd waited for a bill, the Head Teachers Charter <laughs> would have only been enacted once we'd put the provision in place. So there is the first piece of, of evidence. The second piece of evidence is the information that is provided to me by Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Education on the assessment that she has made and Education Scotland are making through thematic inspection of the way in which the approach that we are setting out is being applied by all partners and also through her chairing of the steering group which is implementing this agenda. So I would cite that as the evidence that faster progress has been delivered. Secondly, that Liz Smith uh, moved on to was about baseline data about performance within the education system. And I know the, the issues are, are here to be um, uh, re rehearsed in terms of the information that we publish routinely as part of the National Improvement Framework, where we set out year on year 
the progress that has been made by young people within our education system to a greater degree of detail than has ever been the case in the past, with levels of information published at Primary 1, Primary 4, Primary 7 and S3, where in fact no such comprehensive data was published in the past. And of course, uh, the data that we all are familiar with demonstrates that attainment is improving within our education system and the attainment gap has been closing and that data has been well rehearsed in Parliament before. And finally, on the question of subject choice, uh, obviously um, curriculum control um, is a matter which under the Head Teachers Charter, and this is a relatively recent uh, 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 publication, uh, will be vested in individual schools. Now, there is obviously, we're encouraging collaboration among schools within our education system. And for some schools, collaborating with each other about the availability of subject choice so that across a number of schools, a broader subject choice can be available than if everything was just contained within an individual school requires a degree of collaboration across individual schools. So there will be um, a role for local authorities to be involved in that collaboration. But what I'm confident about from the, uh, uh, the authentication of information I've had from the Chief Inspector of Education is that local authorities are genuinely committed to that progress, that process, and we should welcome that as evidence of the creation of an empowered education system. Uh, now, I do understand you had a lot of questions embedded in that, therefore it was a long answer, and I appreciate the front bench here should also get the chance, but after that, it has to be crisp questions, crisp answers, because I have 12 people wanting to ask questions, and Mr Scott's already in a tizzy. Um, Mr Gray. Uh, thank you, uh, and thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for early sight of his statement. In fact, We've known for a year what this statement would say. Everyone knows the education bill was dropped because no one supported it. And everyone knew Mr Swinney would be back here claiming great progress so he could finally put his flagship legislation out of its misery. But his reforms <coughs> still don't address the real issues in our schools. Squeezed budgets, teacher shortages, a narrowing curriculum, a lack of rigorous data on literacy and numeracy, standardised tests parents don't want and teachers don't rate, an explosion of multi-level teaching, and a crisis in support for pupils with additional support needs. So having spent a year developing and delivering an empowered schools diagram, will the Cabinet Secretary now turn his attention to these real problems in real schools faced daily by real teachers, real pupils, and real parents? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I spend all of my time focused on the real issues that face Scottish education, which is why I follow the international evidence that says that a successful education system will be one where more decisions are taken as close to young people as is possible within the education system. And that is the culture and the approach that we're trying to create through the empowered schools reforms. On the various points that Mr Gray raised, I would just uh, offer a few observations. Um, on the question of budgets, local authority budgets on education have been rising for four years in a row with a substantial increase in real terms in the most recent data available. Teacher numbers stand at the highest level they've stood at since, since 2010, with the largest number of primary teachers in Scottish schools since 1980. On subject choice, I, I know the Education and Skills Committee has been looking at the question of subject choice, but when I look at the options that are available to young people in Scottish education, I think there is a very broad and much broader choice available to young people than when it was the case uh, when I was at school. On Scottish national standardised assessments, uh, we, we commissioned an independent review to examine the issues and it has reported and it has demonstrated the value of standardised assessments. Uh, Mr Gray knows that I am actively uh, working to strengthen and improve the availability of support uh, to meet the needs of young people with additional support needs and will continue to focus on that issue in the period going ahead. So I hope that gives him some reassurance that on all the key questions that he raised as concerns, the government and our local authority partners are doing everything we humanly can do to address these issues. Thank you. I have 13 questioners in 10 minutes. That's we've been told. Alison Johnson followed by Tanvish Scott. Uh, thank you. The intention to devolve powers to schools is to empower head teachers as education leaders, but it's not clear what accountability mechanisms are in place to ensure effective oversight and scrutiny of those head teachers. And they've got enhanced powers now over budget and staffing. Um, power, when powers with the local authority, 
Could um, I have your question, please? Yeah, um, we had democratically elected councillors in place to scrutinise. So what mechanisms are in place through the Head Teachers Charter and the devolved school management guidelines to ensure effective oversight is in place? Cabinet Secretary, if you can briefly, please. Uh, head teachers uh, are obviously uh, impo senior employees of local authorities and will remain so under these reforms. So there's a direct line of accountability in relation to employment issues in that respect. But head teachers have a much broader approach to accountability to pupils, to parents, to communities, to staff, to the way in which schools fulfil the needs of young people. And that is the conversation and discussion that an empowered school must have with its community to make sure the needs of all learners are being met. Tavi Scott, followed by Claire Adams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Isn't the reality uh, for parents and teachers unspent uh, PEF money, unfilled head teacher vacancies and more bureaucracy in classrooms through yet more guidance? If the Education Secretary wants to work with teachers, as he said to, to Parliament today, why doesn't he actually listen to primary one teachers and drop the national testing of four and five year old boys and girls? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I've, I've I listened to an independent review that I commissioned on this question, which found that there was um, a significant value in primary one standardised assessments as contributing to informing the judgment of teachers. I trust teachers' judgments, but I also recognise and I listen to teachers who make a plea for there to be moderation within the education system so they can understand the levels and the standards they're trying to achieve for young people and standardised assessments help inform that judgment. Claire Adamson followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary has previously said that, quote, the best decision about child, children's education are taken by people who know them best, the teachers, head teachers and parents, as well as young people themselves, close quote. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how his decision to fast track the implementation of his reforms has helped achieve those best decisions? Cabinet Secretary. What the, the quote that Claire Addison reads out reflects my uh, reading of the international evidence, which um, argues for more and more decisions to be taken in the classroom by individual empowered classroom teachers. Um, at the heart of the reform agenda, it's also at the, uh, the heart of the, um, the pay and workload deal that we've arrived at with, with uh, the professional associations and our local authority partners, is about creating a sense of teacher autonomy and teacher agency, where teachers can confidently make judgments about the uh, educational journey of young people and the agenda that I've set out today supports and enhances that. Of, that, uh, that Jeremy agenda. Balfour followed by Jenny <coughs> Gilruth. Um, in his statement uh, this time last year the Deputy First Minister spoke of consensus building at the heart of his approach for the shelving of the education bill. Given that we were open to working in consens consensus to pass the bill and given the many defeats the government has faced in this parliament in the past year on education does the Deputy First Minister not now see that reforms should be implemented in the right way and that is through the democratic process of this Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, uh, th this reform is being managed through the democratic process of this Parliament and it's been managed in collaboration with our local authority partners who have statutory responsibility for the delivery of education. Now, Parliament often encourages me to work collaboratively with other people. That's precisely what I've done this agenda and we've made faster progress as a consequence. Jenny Gilruth, followed by Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the reduction in subject-specific principal teacher roles, coupled with a movement to faculty heads in recent years, particularly in our secondaries. Uh, can he provide more detail for what alternative routes for promotion might be available for teachers going forward so that we can make sure we keep talent in our classrooms? Cabinet Secretary. I would encourage members of Parliament to look at the report that's been produced by the, um, the Working Group on Career Pathways, led by uh, Moira Boland of the University of Glasgow. It's a very refreshing read about the creation of new pathways in subject specialism, in uh, pedagogical specialism, uh, and also in uh, disciplines within uh, uh, the education system, for example, on additional support needs. So the, what the review undertook was work on my behalf to create alternatives to administrative route, uh, to routes to administrative leadership within the education system so that we could in, uh, entrench uh, outstanding classroom pra practice within our classrooms and celebrate that and that's what the review has generated. Mary Fee followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Pro provision of additional support needs is fragmented across local authorities. And similarly, we know local authorities use a variety of models in the provision of Homelink. 
Going forward, what steps will the Cabinet Secretary take to ensure Homelink staff are fully resourced and fully supported? Cabinet Secretary. I think Homelink staff provide a, a really valuable uh, role within our education system. Uh, I see increasing numbers of schools uh, opting to use pupil equity funding to establish much greater uh, proficiency and effectiveness in home school link workers. And as a consequence, pupil attendance and participation and attainment as a consequence is improving um, from those efforts. So I think the, uh, the, the government actively works with our local authority partners on the resourcing of all aspects of the education system. And uh, we see, as uh, I indicated, strong and effective practice emerging out of pupil equity funding, which is strengthening the areas of activity in which Mary Fee is interested. Rona Mackay, followed by Jamie Halker Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary expand on how his reforms will help to raise standards and close the poverty related attainment gap? Cabinet Secretary. One of the uh, very clear outcomes of the implementation of the Scottish Attainment Challenge and pupil equity funding has been an ever sharper focus within the education system on the young people who face barriers to fulfilling their potential as a consequence of their background in poverty. And that focus has always been in our education system, but PEF and Scottish Attainment Challenge have intensified that. As a consequence, we are now seeing real improvements in the performance of young people, the closing of the attainment gap, and obviously the data will be published in the years to come to demonstrate the pattern that takes in the years to come. Jamie Halko Johnson, followed by Tom Arthur. Scottish Government statistics for 2017-18 show the gap between the most and least affluent going to university has actually increased in the last year. And the official statistics from last year's exam results show the attainment gap between school pupils from the poorest and richest areas has increased too. So can the Cabinet Secretary say whether he thinks the backdoor reforms have been successful in this regard? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly, the, on, on the measures that we have published, the attainment gap is closing and has closed over time. And on the point of uh, access to, um, to university education, that we are at a record high in the proportion of young people going to university from the most deprived areas in Scotland. So I, I, I don't quite understand um, the data that Mr. Halko Johnson is uh, marshalling to undermine what his outstanding uh, achievements in performance as a consequence of the uh, focus we have on widening access in higher education. Tom Arthur, followed by uh, Daniel Johnson. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the Scottish Government has ensured that the voices of parents and pupils have been heard throughout the reform process and will continue to be heard going forward, given the benefit this collaborative approach is having for schools in my constituency, such as St Anthony's and Johnson? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we, the National Parent Forum of Scotland is um, a, a key partner in all of our uh, reform activity. Uh, we listen closely to the, we in involve them in all of our activity. We listen closely to the contents of their thinking in all aspects of the education reform journey. And we will continue to do that as we strengthen uh, parental and pupil voice within education. Uh, Daniel Johnson, and if you're brief, I'll get in Gordon MacDonald. Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you. The one hard figure in the statement is the £5 million for regional improvement collaboratives. So could the Cabinet Secretary confirm that that will be recurring funding? How many net new roles has that created within the education system? And could he elaborate and give a specific example of the interventions uh, that the regional collaboratives have been implementing in the last year? Well, that's more than one question. Anyway, Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I can't give uh, Mr Johnson the, the headcount number uh, in relation to the, uh, the, the funding for regional improvement collaboratives, but I'll, I'll happily write to him about that. On the uh, concrete examples of what the regional improvement collaboratives are doing, um, they are running uh, improvements in literacy and numeracy programmes um, with tried and tested evidence-based practice being used to inform and to strengthen professional development. They are delivering moderation support in different across regional boundaries to make sure that uh, teachers across the broad general education have a better understanding of standards. Uh, they are uh, putting in place um, exchanges of learning about the measures that are closing the attainment gap fastest in areas of deprivation to make sure that learning can be shared across the board. So there is a, a, a real collaborative spirit been taken forward within our uh, regional improvement collaboratives and that's sharing good educational practice across the system. Gordon MacDonald and straight to your question please. Yeah, I welcome Scottish Government's ongoing commitment to empowering teachers and on securing a landmark deal on teachers pay but can the Cabinet Secretary expand on the support that will be provided to help reduce teachers unnecessary workload? 
A short expansion, Cabinet Secretary. The, the, the whole concept of teacher agency is about empowering our teachers to have professional confidence to make judgments about all aspects of the curriculum, but crucially also as, uh, judgments about their workload. And I've just come from a meeting of the Scottish Education Council this morning at which all players in Scottish education committed to some further joint work on reducing unnecessary teacher bureaucracy to enable teachers to focus on what we all want them to focus on, which is the learning and teaching of young people in Scotland. And thank you. That concludes the question. And I apologise to James Dorn and Neil Finlay, who were additional questioners, didn't quite manage to reach you. Uh, we're shortly move on to the next item of business. <laughs>